Hi, this is Martin Carthy, and you are listening to Retrospectives with are John Broughton gone? on KC Radio 97.7 FM. Honestly, Saint Rosemary Antoine. Hello? Uh, hi, is that Martin? It is. Hi, Martin. Is that uh, John? It is. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing very well indeed. How am I going for the time? It is 9 a.m. over there? It is exactly. It is 9 a.m. Exactly 9 a.m. Oh, good. I get I get a little confused with the time differences sometimes, especially around daylight saving time when the change yeah, happens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll try not to uh, to test your memory too much uh, today, but we'll see how we go. Good. Okay. Just to start, though, just to go way back, do you have a, a very earliest musical memory from from your childhood? Uh, oh. Um. Um, my fir- the first record I, I remember having, I think, well, I think what I'm remembering right now was the parade of the tin, the parade of the tin soldiers. Ah. Which was, uh, um, it was, it was really popular, popular on on on, uh, on children's hour. I think it was the, uh, I, I think it was the theme music for something on children's hour. Okay. Just moving forward a bit, though, can you pinpoint a specific moment or, or a period in time when music really started to, to take hold of a, as being a, an important part of your life? Well, it always did. We we we, we, um, we were a family that didn't make music together, but we listened to music together, and we sat. Um, my sister and I used to sing a lot in church. Um, that was that was a, that was about it. Um, music really really took a grip. I don't remember. I don't remember music n- not being there. Um, but as for uh, as for it becoming an obsession, that 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 waited that waited until uh, when I was in a I was a chorister, and then then I heard Lonnie Donegan, and then music seemed to be everything. I was I was being being a chorister and singing Orlando Gibbons and Thomas Tallis. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> then going to the coffee bar and and, and, and singing the wreck of the old ninety seven, <laughs> um, you know it's a and it never seemed like a clash to me. <laughs> it, all <laughs> made, it all made sense, um, but uh, it, it, I mean music great then gradually took, would, would, would take over. I mean I, I, I suppose I was uh, fifteen when when that sort of thing was happening. And gradually, it, it, it took over everything. Tell I us about getting, I, 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 I got I got into re- really sc- quite serious trouble at school because um, I was supposed to be supposed to be at, at uh, home doing my homework, and I was in the coffee I was in the coffee bar a couple of nights a week, singing and making uh, ten ten shillings and uh, a, a, and a plate of spaghetti, <laughs> um, and somebody th- 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 in one of the evening papers. There was a, they had a, 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 a readers could send in photographs they'd taken, and if it was printed, they got I, th- I think it was five quid, which is a lot then. Mm. Um, might have been a quid. I, 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 I actually don't remember, but my picture was in one of the evening papers, singing in our co- in, in my my coffee bar, my local coffee bar, and uh, I, I I got a. I got a ferocious telling off from the headmaster. I didn't get the cane. You know, those were the days of beatings. Um, I didn't get the cane, but I came. I, I think I came within a whisker of getting the cane. Um, but that's yeah. Basically, schooling was over by that time. I was. Uh, I was just not interested anymore. Just music was everything. Tell us about the the uh, period of the skiffle the skiffle movement. We we were certainly aware of it down here in Australia, but uh, apparently it was huge over there. How how important do you rate that time in in terms of your development as a musician? Oh, it was, it, it was massive, absolutely massive for everybody. They, they sold quite literally millions millions of guitars, um, and it was it was the beginning of uh, of, the, of that. It, it was when the folk, the folk revival actually did explode. They're, they're, it was it was very very small up until then, and suddenly this great wave of of of, of, of people, so the teenagers, uh, ca- ca- came into it. But it also came into came came into in, into into rock and roll, and later on into jazz jazz and classical music, and in, in, into um, uh, into flamenco and just about any 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 kind of guitar. When when the skiffle the skiffle movement, you know, the skiffle bubble exploded. 
then um, all these people who bought guitars went off and um, played the guitar, but found other ways of doing it. You know, you, you would have people who, who went into folk music, and lots of them, <clears throat> but I, I used to know this uh, classical guitar, guitar player called George Clinton, who was a wonderful, wonderful player. But he started off as a classical player, and his brother Tony was a really, really, really demon flamenco guitarist. He started off in the Skiffle group. Um, it was, Skiffle actually was a massive revival in, in, in people's music. People just picked up instruments for the first time in I don't know how long, and um, well, certainly in a generation, and, uh, and, and taught themselves. It was an extraordinary moment. But it's huge for the folk scene. You're right. Yeah. What about the American folk and blues sounds in those early days when you were soaking up your influences? How, how important were they to you? Massive, because I mean, skiffle was basically it, it was basically um, uh, bits of country music and, uh, and bits of folk music, bits of Woody Guthrie, bits of Lead Belly. Um, so we all went digging back to, 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 to see what was going on there. Uh, the, the first guitarist I heard who made, made me want to play properly was Big Bill Brunsey. Ah, yes. Uh, and the second would, would be Elizabeth Cotton. And I, and I heard about her because I, I read in, I think I read in the Daily Herald, um, that, uh, which was the paper we used to get, that, uh, that, that, that this mysterious, mysterious to me, um, nanny and housekeeper in Washington, D.C., had sued the Ch uh, Chas McDevitt of the Chas McDevitt Skiffle Group because he had claimed to have written Freight Train. And she wrote it and could prove it. Um, so you know, there, there was this whopping payout. I don't know how much, but um, it was, there was a, a big payout. Uh, and I, I remember thinking, when something like that happened, you know, I, I and I suppose all, all my contemporaries would, would, would go nosing around to find out who this person was. And I went, I, I saw her, um, I saw her record in, in, in a record shop. They, they, I suppose there were there, there were folk record shops, but there were jazz record shops. There was one in particular on Charing Cross Road called Doug, uh, called Dobell's D O B E double -L, L S um, Dobell's Jazz Record Shop, and um, it was all jazz. And Doug Dobell was a uh, was, was a jazz fanatic, but he had he had one box on the counter which which had folk records in it. And right at the front, there was a record, uh, a, a folkways record, um, and it said "Negro Folk Songs and Tunes" by Elizabeth Cotton. Mm. And it was, and, and the first track was was uh, Wilson Rag, and the second track was Freight Train. And I decided this must be the woman, and it was. Yeah. And I bought the record, took it home, and played it, and I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. This guitar, this wonderful mm. lyrical guitar playing a mile away from Big Bill Broomsey because he was you know hard driving stuff and I, 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 I was learning him I was buying those records and slowing them down and trying to learn how to play them but Elizabeth Cotton was something else it was just beautiful lyrical playing and I, I just I just fell in love with it straight away and it was hard work to try and learn it slow, slowing it down because it was complex stuff sure was but, um, yeah. But I did, I did, and it's, um, and I, I, you know, I, I met her, what, God, I met her, I met her 20 years later, um, and she was still gigging, she was still, she was still gigging into her 90s, <clears throat> and uh, I mean, I, I met her 20 years, 20 years after buying that first record, and, uh, and, she, and she was playing at a folk festival, and she sat and played, played freight train, and I burst into tears. <laughs> Oh, I sat there like, crying like a baby. I was so yeah. happy to see her play. It was wonderful. She was, she was amazing, lady. Right? She, she, she worked, really was. She worked in the Seagate household for a while. I she did, and, yeah. and, and uh, they didn't know. That was the, 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 the really astonishing thing. Peggy, I don't know if Peggy has ever told you the story. But they, um, they, they came home, and uh, I mean, <laughs> Libba was the, was the woman. She was housekeeper, and she looked after the kids, and... Oh, da -de -a -de -a -de -a -de -a. And they came, you know, they came home, walked through the door, and there was this music in the house. And somebody thought, whoever it was, who's, who's that the radio on? And they went in, looking around, and there she was, sitting in sitting in the sitting room, playing one of the, one, one of the uh, one of the family's guitars. <laughs> Only she was playing it. To, she was left-handed, and she was playing it left-handed and upside down. 
which is one of the reasons why it was so hard to learn to learn her records because uh, because that's the way she played. She uh, played yeah. left handed and upside down, and there were things <laughs> she could do that you couldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. It was just a great discovery for them. They must have been really excited because they were the folks of experts and they didn't know what was right <laughs> under their nose. It was a fabulous right. moment for them. Yeah. I believe you had uh, theatrical ambitions in, in your younger days. How serious did that get? Um, well, I, I decided I was, go I was going to be an actor because I'd been in the school play. Um, and uh, I very quickly found out that it was, um, that, that it was slightly more difficult than that. Um, I really did enjoy it. I had, um, uh, well, I, I walked out of school at the end of the spring term, uh, right, right at the beginning of March 1959, and walked out of school and told, walked in, went home and said to my mum, I'm not going back to school next ne next term. And she just looked at me and said, well, you better get a job then. So mm. um, I was sort of hanging about and I was, doing what we did in those days and um, gate crashing parties on a Saturday night. I met this bloke who uh, who didn't announce who he was, but said that, um, oh, leave me a phone number. You never know. I might come across something because I do meet people like that. Um, and I, I, I went home after the party. You know, I got home at about six in the morning or something. <coughs> and uh, about half 11, the phone rang. And my mum shouted up, it's for you. So I uh, went down, and it was this guy I'd been talking to, and he was the stage director at the Regent's Park Open Air Theatre. And they were, just start, they were just starting rehearsals. And he said, it's not much of a job, but you can have the job as prompter if you want it. It's, uh, it's five bob a show. Uh, this, which, and the pay, so the pay is rubbish. And we usually give it to a student, but if you want it, it's yours. And it's a start. What mm -hmm. do you think? So I went. I went along on the Monday, and met this. Uh, met the, you know, the the boss of the company was a man called Robert Atkins, who was one of the last of the old actor managers. And uh, it, it was that. That was it. I was. I, I was the prompter. It was, a, it was a fantastic season. The next thing I did uh, walked straight away into a. Uh, uh, an uh, ASM, assistant stage manager, on a tour of The Merry Widow, which went on, which started off as a six month tour and then were, and ended up going on for nine months, damn near. And it was, uh, uh, that, that was learning, le learning about how to look after props, basically, because that, that was my job. Um, and I had a small part of it, which began to teach me that I wasn't, that uh, theatre probably wasn't uh, acting anyway, wasn't really going to be up my street. And then I went straight into a uh, theatre in the round where you actually had to make the props. So I went in, I went in knowing nothing, and I came out, came out armed to the teeth, but um, didn't get another job. Um, and just then the folk scene was starting up, and I, the guitar was always, always with me. I always took my guitar when I, when I, when I went away on the road. I always took my guitar. And the, the guitar, the guitar took over again. Yeah. Um, just, but and, and I fancied, I fancied, I, I, I think I still fancied for about a year after I'd uh, come out, of, uh, a, a year uh, after a year out of work, put it that way. I still fancied I was going to be going to be an actor uh, because I put it in my passport that I was an actor. <laughs> um, but it was um, music took over. Music but, took over. Just the same though, has there always been, in the years that have followed, has there always been this actor within you when, you when you're performing songs on stage? Is there an element of, of the acting craft still there? I don't think so. I don't no? think so. It's a, diff it's, a diff it's a different thing. Because with, with, with acting, you're, you're, you're assuming a part. I know there was a part of the folk scene. You, you and McColl used to, you, would tell people that, uh, that, 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 that there, yeah. were, there was a lot of common ground. And I'm, I'm not sure that I go along with that. Um, he was, I mean, he's a brilliant performer and all the rest of it. A tremendous presence on stage. But I think, I think it's a different, it's a distinct thing. Um, you're, telling, you're telling a story. You're not, you're not being an actor. You're not taking the parts. Uh, you, you, you need to know background. One of, I mean, one of the things about uh, that, those, those songs is um, the the amount of stuff that's take would, would, would have been taken for granted by the people who sang them a hundred years ago? You know, uh, who were 
who uh, the old the, the uh, original collectors at the turn of the 19th and 20th century who they met um they had a whole lot of background that we know nothing about and, and could sing a song and the people around them would be able to make all those assumptions and we, we we know very little about that so you have to find out about that and then try and still make it work and uh it's 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 because the songs have always changed if mm. you see what i mean yeah they've, they're, 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 they're really mobile things mutable things um and i i've found over the years i've been seeing some songs for 50 years and um, I think I think they, a lot of them have changed, and, and it's it's subconscious. You don't sit down. Oh, I've got to change these words. Um, but they they acquire your your vernacular, I think yeah. sometimes. And that's um, it's interesting to see how 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 mutable they can be. How, and it's a very exciting. It's actually very exciting in a very in a, in quite a downbeat way. You realise how much has changed without you really looking. Mm. Now, it's well written that it was your arrangement of Scarborough Fair that was an inspiration to Paul Simon. Is it true that Paul was reluctant to, to point the credit in your direction for that? No, it's not true. I, I, did, I, I did believe that for a while, but then um, I, have to, I have to acknowledge that, <clears throat> that it's, playing the victim is very comfortable. Is, is, you know, it's a very comforting and comfortable thing. Yeah. Um, and I did it. I did it for a good while. I remember thinking, at one point, I began to call it the trudge through the grudge, and <laughs> it was just, you know, it, just it, it, it became a pain in the backside. It really did. And I got a phone call from a mate of mine who worked for the Performing Rights Society, <clears throat> and he just dropped into the conversation. Oh, I just thought you'd be interested to know that. Um, do you know Paul Simon has never has never had a payout from PRS over Scarborough Fair. And that you know, t took a while to penetrate, and then it dawned on me that there was uh, there was uh, that I'd been had by a third person who had taken all the money, and that uh, that third person was not a musician, um, uh, and and he wasn't a manager. But uh, there we are. Um, somebody made an awful lot of money out of it, and it was not Paul, and it was not me. Ah. Um, the person who the, the the only person who made money out of that recording. Was was Art Garfunkel because he wrote the Canticle. If you remember, it was called a Scarborough Fair Stroke Canticle. That's right, yeah. And and Art Garfunkel wrote the Canticle, so he got he got some money. Probably made quite a lot of money. Good luck to him. Um, and Paul always used to say, I, I met him in 1998. He rang me up actually. He was on a European tour, and I got this phone call out of the blue. Um, Hello, this is Paul here, and I, <laughs> I know a lot of Pauls, mm -hmm. but his voice was unmistakable. And I said, "Really, Paul?" And he said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on the road in Stockholm. I'm going to be in London on such and such a day. I'm doing on the days. I'm doing three gigs at the Hammersmith Apollo. Do you want to come along and sing?" And I could, I could go on the, actually on the last day, so I went along, <clears throat> and uh, and we sang Scarborough Fair together. And the interesting th thing for me was that Paul is, is one of those people who says very little hmm. or all of a sudden says a lot and it comes out in a great deluge. And in all the time I'd known him when he was living in London, my impression was that I, I, we said half a dozen words to each other, you know? Hmm. And when we, we came off the stage <coughs> in, uh, in, at the Hammersmith Apollo, we sat in that back room and he talked almost nonstop for about 45 minutes um, and it was just really it was delightful and gratifying and 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 I don't want to get too poncy but healing as well yeah. because there was I I've been going around for years be, being the victim and being quite comfortable in it and then realizing this is this is really stupid nonsense stop it uh, and there he was saying I'd tell people, you know, that I learned this, this guy called Martin Carthy, and basically they'd say, oh, that's interesting, very interesting, you know, with the pen still poised above the paper and not writing it nah. down. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it's pe people do talk about, people like Paul do talk about pe people they've met. He, I mean, on that tour he was saying that he was um, trying to get in touch with all the people he'd met and some of them he just hadn't seen for years and years and years, and others he'd fallen out with. 
and he was trying to use that tour to 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 pull all the strands together and 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 uh, make things right with uh, with, with so many different people. That's some closure. Who may have felt wronged. Maybe he, maybe they were slightly wronged, or maybe they weren't. Maybe people just drift apart, and you don't get it. Don't get a chance to uh, to make anything. Why do you want to make it final anyway? Um, but just to, to get things right, get get things you know, back in line, back in back and making sense again. And um, no, he said. He's a good man. I mean, wh- one of the things he did say. Am I rabbiting on too much? No, no, you're fine. <laughs> okay, okay. Wh- one one of the things uh, wh- one of the things he did say was that you know he said you remember what it was like then. He said we were, none of us were much good, and if if one person got a great idea, everybody jumped on it and everybody would want to play it. When Davy Graham had Angie, everybody you had to be able to play Angie. You had to do it. That's it. So everybody learned how to play Angie. I certainly did. Um, and he said, and then Bert played something like, I don't know, Strolling Down the Highway. So everybody had to learn how to play Strolling Down the Highway. So we all did. And I had Scarborough Fair, so everybody learned how to play Scarborough Fair. Um, and it was the way we improved. And he said, but when, when uh, Art Garfunkel and I were about to, 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 to give in and, and just drop the whole thing, and then a, 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 a producer in New York put a drum track on Sound of Silence. Just stuck a drum track on on, on, on Sound of Silence, and it went straight to number one. Mm. He said, and after that, everything I touched turned to gold. That's what happened. He said, I don't have an explanation for it. That's what happened. And it, it's just about true, isn't it, when you think yeah, about it? That's right. You know, he, he, his output up to then was not large. But everything went, everything went, went crazy. And um, then he started doing, do, doing the solo career, and uh, he really turned into a fabulous writer. Really did. Wonderful writer. That was basically... Nice the, guy, too. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, 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 what were no, you no. saying? That, that was basically the birth of, of the folk rock era of the mid to late 60s. Yourself, were you ever tempted to take your music down a more commercial path at that time? Um, no, I was, I was, I mean, if, 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 if what, if what any of us, I don't know, I don't know how to answer that. I'm to let me, let me, let me flounder for a second and think about that. <laughs> um, the, the answer basically was, um, was no. Um, when I got terribly self-important, when, when I signed to Fontana to make my first album, I was sit- sitting in the office of the boss of Philips Fontana, a man called Jack Baverstock, <clears throat> and and I was I was being terribly you know terribly pure and terribly terribly regal, and he said, um, hey, here's here's a tune here. I want you I want you to record this one. Put that on. So here's a folk song, and he put on this 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 thing, and I said, I said that's not a folk song. He said, sure it is. I said, no, it's not. And he said, if I told you that you'd uh, that you record that or you don't get the contract, what would you do? I said, I'd, I'd, I'd walk away. And he looked at me and I could see this look in his face that was saying, oh God, who is this idiot? <laughs> 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 and I was feeling no, terribly righteous. But I, I would have, you know, I would have done. Um, so I, I, want, I wanted to stick to what I, what, what, what I was finding out about. I, I, can't, I can't say I knew it because uh, I'd, I'd not been at it that long. Mm. I suppose I, I, I thought I knew, knew a hell of a lot about it. Um, but I still, had that, I still had that attitude that we all had in Skiffle, which was that people were always telling us that we were rubbish. And uh, you know, me and my mates we were, we were always telling us that we, we were rubbish. And we would sit back and look at each other and go, you just don't know. You don't know how good we are. <laughs> and you don't understand just how great this music is. You're just an idiot. You don't understand. And there was still a, a fairly large chunk of that attitude in me because there was so much... I, yeah, in, in, with, the, with the wisdom of hindsight, I can say there was, so, there was so much to find out and I wanted to know about it. And I didn't want to waste my time on anything else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, oh, absolutely. It, it seems that your priority has always been to seek out and perform traditional songs rather than, than write songs yourself to any great degree. Has it been a regret? Uh, looking back yeah. over time, that you haven't focused as heavily on your own songwriting. Um, I've only written when I had to. Now I've heard people say p- people write because they have to, 
and I found out that I had to write something when uh, during the Thatcher years. I wrote two songs during the Thatcher years, and I've never, I, I've not written a song from scratch since then. Mm. But there, I, I, I got so angry that finally one song came out, and it was a song about the Falklands. And then, because um, there was so much phony nonsense going on then, and uh, then the, uh, if, if, when I was three quarters of the way writing through that, another song appeared about um, um, what was happening in South Africa, because my family had from, from the moment uh, Dr. Milan was was uh, was elected for the National Party in 1948, my family was uh, was involved in 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 um, I suppose it became a, a little personal boycott. My mum would, but my, my my dad always got he got shoes from South Africa. He got these Veltschuhen from South Africa, and he loved them. And and he also got <laughs> he got shoes and marmalade. <laughs> from South Africa, and my mum would, would would say, you know, would basically say to him, without while we were out of earshot, would say, you know, this has got to finish. You can't, you can't do that. You know, these people are are are, are making laws which are excluding the, the majority of the population. You can't do this. You don't support that. Stop doing it. Stop, buying, stop buying. I know it's lovely marmalade, but stop <laughs> it. And I know it's, you get four or five tins of the stuff at a time, of the stuff, and you do love it, and I love it too. But we, you know, we'll, we'll get different marmalade. We'll make the bloody stuff. Yeah. You know? um, and, uh, and, and the shoes went on for a, for a bit longer, but eventually stopped doing that too. Um, yeah, it was... Um, so there was... And sorry, and, and my involve, involvement in music when it became, you know, uh, my 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 complete, it was there 100 100 percent of the time, taking all all my time up. One of the things that we were all involved in was the anti-apartheid movement. Mm -hmm. You know, and there was CND and anti-apartheid, and that was uh, that was that was what we did. So it's always been there, and then it all. It, this song came out in 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 the run up. It was about the run up to uh, to, to to the release of Nelson Mandela, and uh, I I actually sang the song more recently at a uh, at a, a a concert of um um it was it was about the civil rights movement in America, and I didn't have a song then. The guys insisted uh, insisting that I I do a song. Come on, you must have a song about it. So I, I dredged this song out of my memory. I'd not sung it for a long time. And I sang it to him, and he, and he just sat there and he looked, and he said, that's very good, you know, you should sing that. So mm -hmm. I sang it. Um, and I looked back on it, and yeah, it was it's a pretty damn good song, but it came, it, uh, it, 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 took, it took Margaret Thatcher saying um, they should hang Nelson Mandela, which is what one of the things she said, um, to to to, to galvanise me into writing it, mm. she made just just made me and my family so basically angry that she could do what she was doing and did quite deliberately, apart from anything else, create a new underclass, a new poor. That's what she did, and these buggers right now are doing the same thing again. Mm. But I digress. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, someone who I'm sure never made you too angry, Dave Swarbrick, uh, someone you've had a long uh, association with through the years. Uh, can you recall your first meeting with Dave? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, I, I reckon it was 1961, um, and it was at the Troubadour, and I was knocking around with these three lads from Harvard University who were an old-timey group. It was uh, banjo, guitar, and, and mandolin doubling fiddle, the fiddle man, man, mandolin player, double fiddle. Um, and they were, they were sort of, they, they, were, they were all microbiology students, I think. Uh, oh no, so the guitar player was, was, was a, uh, an English literature, uh, English literature student at Harvard. And um, they had this old timey group called the Charles River Valley Boys. And they were doing great stuff. I used to, I used to love it. And they were playing in, in, in the, the banjo player was playing in all sorts of different tunings, which is where I first heard all that stuff, which really obsessed me later on. Although it's obsessed me until now, and, and will go on doing so until the day I drop dead. Mm. Um, and um, 
the 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 fiddle player fiddle fiddle doubling mandolin player had to go had to go home ethan he was called ethan signer and um the other two sort of hung around for a long time bob and clay and uh they um well, I was at the troubadour, and they turned up and they said, "Hey, come on, we're, we've got we, we've got a new fiddle player. We're gonna we're gonna we're, and this this they'd met him. They'd met this guy on the train, and the two of them jumped up and started playing really excitedly, and uh, and this fiddle player was standing there with this totally perplexed, bewildered look on his face, trying to trying to figure out what they were doing, and it was Dave. Hmm. Um, I, 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 we didn't talk, but I I always remembered him because. He obviously knew something, but what it was wasn't what they were doing. Next time I saw him, it was uh, next time I, uh, I yeah next time I saw him, it was with this group. It was they called themselves the Ian Campbell Folk Five, um, and there he was. And we we just we, we always we always connected. Let's put it that way. We yeah. hardly we, we we hardly talked to begin with, but we always connected. And when I but I used to go up to the folk club. I think the first time I went up to uh, to 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 the uh, Campbell's Folk Club in um, it was a pub called the Crown, right by New Street Station, New, New Street Railway Station. Um, yeah, I stayed at Dave's. Hmm. Yep. I mean, his first wife. He's had a lot of wives since then. His first wife had, a, had just bought a minor bird. So all I can remember is her walking around the house shouting, minor bird, minor bird, trying to get it to talk. And it did. I mean, eventually she taught it how to talk. <laughs> yes. Another great connection you have, and it goes beyond just making music together, of course, is with the Watersons. Uh, yeah. Tell us how that connection came to be. Ooh. Well, uh, it goes back, that goes back to 1961 as well, I think. Um I got a phone call from this, uh, the, the one agent, the one folk agent there was at the time, who was a man called Malcolm Nixon, who used to organize um, Ewan McColl's club, which was called the Ballads and Blues in those days. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> he, uh, he organized his club, and then they had this big falling out, and he became an agent. And Ewan wrote this uh, song that was absolutely bristling with contempt called Mr. Ten Percent. Um, and I got a, got a phone call from this man, Malcolm Nixon, and he said, um, I've got a gig for you if you want it. Uh, it's you and Red Sullivan and Steve Benbow to go to Hull. And uh, got a letter and everything saying what we were to do. And we all travelled up on the train together. Um, I remember being exhausted once we got to Hull because Steve Benbow told jokes all the way. <laughs> and he was a very funny man. Um, and I just was worn out with laughing, uh, but still had a great time. And the the, the, the woman who organised it was uh, was Norma. She was known as she was Mrs. Anderson. When you, when you get to Hull, you ask for Mrs. Anderson. When you get to the to the place, the, uh, the the play the hall where you're singing, ask for Mrs. Anderson. And they had um, uh, Norma had uh, was running a club, and they had a, a lot of money, and they were about to lose it all because they'd made too much money, they would lose it all if they didn't spend it. So they rang up this agent and said, please send us a folk, uh, send us a folk concert. And Norma and I met, and uh, it was one of those instantaneous con uh, connections. But at that time, she was married and I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And the second time we met was two years later, and I was married and she wasn't. <laughs> so we actually w uh, eventually went away to, the, uh, to, to, to be a DJ in Montserrat, for four years and uh and when she came back she wasn't married and neither was i uh, third time lucky so we set about we set about putting things right so it only took 11 years <laughs> <laughs> but i used to go and watch the watsons because they were the watsons changed everything up until up until they came along um every single group was modeled on the weavers it was the American model. Yeah. Every group had a, a guitar player, at least had a guitar player, a banjo player, and a girl singer. Every group. Um, and the Warsons followed that model to begin with, but then started singing this this stuff that they stuff that they do. You know, the uh, the normal Lau and Mike had a had a way of singing together, which they they they'd. Uh, 
contrived when they were kids, when they were tiny. They would always sing together, and, and uh, the women set the key, and, and Mike had to find his way around. So Mike developed this huge range. He could sing right up, uh, right up high and sing in unison with them and even above them. And then when he felt it was necessary to see a bit of bass, he would dive down into dive down into the cellar, right down into the you know, into, into the sepulchre and sing that sing that low. Um so he had this whopping range, something like two and a half to three octaves, which is amazing for a bloke. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, coupled that with the most astonishing breath control, which is uh something he developed when he was a kid. Um uh, just, an, just, an, just a truly astonishing singer. But the, as I say, the, uh, the the three of them got together with with a cousin, which was John John Harrison, and um, they they produced this noise that changed everything. And, and I hear recordings of them back in God. When when did they first record? Sixty three, I think they did New Voices in sixty three, and then uh, Frost and Fire in sixty four. I listen to that stuff now, and it's it could have been recorded yesterday. I mean, the voices mm. sound sound a lot younger, but the attitude, the, the the way they sang, just does not date. And everybody else, every everybody else dates like mad because it it's it derives from the Weavers, and the Weavers were an American model. It's funny that the that the the Americans uh, now, now talk about. Um, um, how they were they were affected by what was going on, but by the folk scene over here. So it really switched it switched sides. Originally we were we followed them, and then they came and followed us. Fascinating. It is. It is. Yeah. And happened happened with blues too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Didn't it just? Didn't it just? Yeah. We a lot of our blokes introduced Americans to the blues for the first time. <laughs> it really is bizarre, isn't it? But it helped a lot of other people along the way. People sure. like, you know, Muddy Waters and Buddy Guy. The wonderful Buddy Guy. Yes. It must give you a great sense of pride now to a sense of pride now to see your daughter Eliza making her mark in music. Was it always inevitable that uh, music was going to be her calling as well? Um I think I think maybe so. I uh, I don't think we knew it. Um we kept telling her that she ought to, because she she was uh, she, she's also she was great at school, but she had one um, major hiccup at school, and that was just as she was cut, uh, she she was beginning to uh, get ready for her A levels, she got pneumonia, mm-hmm. and it really it knocked her for six, and uh, she ended up leaving school the following term, which was coincidental. I mean, I was I was away in the states. And I got the dreaded phone call, and maybe you've had it. I don't know. You need you need to talk to your daughter. <laughs> that was the phone call. You, <laughs> have you had that? Have you ever had that call? <laughs> What's happened? I said. Said she's she, she's left school, and I said, what the hell do you expect me to say? She's seventeen. She's leaving at the end of the spring term. That's exactly what I did. What am I going to say to her? Mm. You need to talk to your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> So I taught on my daughter, and I just said, you know, just I, I don't know what, what I'm supposed to say to you. If that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do, and you have to have to you know, get on with it. And uh, she she would go down into Scarborough and uh, and busk to get money because Norma absolutely refused to allow her to sign on the doll. Uh-huh. You sign on the dole, you leave this house. You work. You don't. You. You. you, you know, we, we. We don't do that in this family. Um, so she did, and she would. Uh, I mean, so she didn't. She went down into Scarborough, and uh, and, um, and and would busk on the pedestrian precinct, precinct, and did you know, did well too. <clears throat> and then met up with Nancy Kerr, uh, and they came out to us a couple of times. I think certainly once. And had a great time. Um, you know, they were they, they were about as different as they could be mm-hmm. as far as fiddle playing is concerned. Because Nancy is very precise. I think she's been playing since she was six or something. So she's extremely polite, uh, extre- very technical, very very good, very imaginative. And Liza was uh, all, you know, blood and thunder and everything. And, and often not sticking to the tune, which would infuriate Nancy. 
but um, they just produced wonderful music together, really vibrant stuff. And I think they, I think it can be said that they kick-started the, uh, the the latest round of folk revival. Yeah, oh, that's okay. I really do. I think yeah. I think it's, it's, the two of them are, are can, can be said to be responsible for it. So many people followed followed in their footsteps. And the thing that was astonishing to me, you know, I've been doing it for a few years. Then, and it, what astonished me was how quickly, you know, kids were coming up to me and saying. Are you really Liza's dad? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Liza's your daughter. No, you are Eliza's dad. <laughs> and then I was slightly surprised to begin with, and then I just, you know, just, just let it go. Yes, yes, I. That's the way it is. She's, uh, but she's always been. When we were working together, as you know, starting together as, as, as Waters and Carthy, when did we do that? Um, she was sixteen, I think, or seventeen. Sixteen. We first did it. She always operated as an equal. She was never an apprentice. She always was always on an equal footing. Um, it was uh, that was one of the things that made it so good. Yeah, it was, it was a, a three three way effort. She was she was never in tow. She was always always up the front with uh, with, with the rest of us. It was uh, she's a little powerhouse, which is you know she's not not little anymore, but she's. Uh, always was a real powerhouse putting yourself in the place of a, of, a, of a observer of folk music are you confident that the traditions of the music form and in particular its songs will, re, will maintain a level of interest in decades to come I don't see why not it is cyclical though isn't it yeah. um, um, so we, we uh, it seemed to skip a generation you know, we were. How old was I when when Liza was doing it? I was, I was forty eight, and uh, w- w- when Liza, forty eight, yeah, forty eight. When 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 Liza left, when Liza, Liza came, to, came Liza came. Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm floundering again for a second. Nineteen eighty nine. We 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 all went over to Vancouver and sang at the festival. Uh, so she was 14. Um, yeah, that's when we, I think Norma and I knew that she was going to do music because she came off the stage having sung to 25,000 people and been sort of given a fantastic reception, came off the stage and announced that she was leaving school and we had to tell her, it's illegal. <laughs> we had to stay on for another two years. Oh, yeah. I, I grumble, grumble, grumble. I think it's good. It's just, just, just do it. And then after that, you do what you want to do. And you know, and I suppose three years later, not two, she uh, she did leave school and she went into music and proceeded to blow everybody away. Sure. But she, um, she, she could. She she revealed uh, um, the writer in her quite early on, um, and she always had that capacity. You listen to her songs and you think, how the hell does this seventeen eighteen year old person know that? Hmm. And that's what you know, when when a, when somebody's good, they have these insights at you know at, at that age that, that really take you aback. Um, She's not alone. <clears throat> there are others who can do it too, but it's just seeing it on your own doorstep of one, one of your own is uh, is extraordinary. And she, uh, uh, Lal, Norma's, Norma's baby sister, um, loved the way she wrote because Lal was a writer. I don't, mm. do, do you know about Lal's work? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's um, yeah. She, she, she's she was an astonishing writer. We've just done a. Uh, done a little tour celebrating her work and it just made me realise how utterly, utterly brilliant she was, very quietly. Mm. Um, and she had absolutely loved the way Liza wrote. And uh, part of that is that Liza would, Liza shared a lot of, uh, you know, Liza wrote a, a lot like Lal a lot of the time. You know, just sometimes just going going into places musically and lyrically that other people won't go. Um, yes. 
Um, <clears throat> Martin, just before I let you go, what, what's the extent of your live performances these days, and uh, what, up, what upcoming plans can you tell us about? Uh, well, I've got. Uh, I, 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 I'm still, still, <coughs> still doing gigs. It's just, it's um, musicians don't retire, and I can't see any reason to retire. It's, it's, if I wanted to just lie, lie down and vegetate and fall to bits and drop dead in a few years, that's the way to do it. It seems to me. Yeah. Um, and there's two. There's still so much to find out about and so much to there's a lot to learn um so yeah you find you can't you can't do um, I, I find that there's things i can't do anymore because physically i'm not uh, i'm not up to it but there's other things i'm getting better at you know i'm i'm you get i think, I think you get better at uh, actually telling the stories and i've always loved loved the stories fabulous stories and it's such Bloody intelligent music. There's su there's such a hinterland to it that's really interesting and 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 informative and educational. I mean, in the proper sense, it tells you about uh, about being alive um, and how to do it. Um, <clears throat> there's too much to find out to think about retiring. So I so I, I I gig all the time. I mean, I can't. One of the things that folkies can't do if they don't write any songs or write enough songs. Is that you can't live on your royalties. Mm. You know, you've got yeah, there, there, there's there's still there's bills to pay, so you you've got to do it. And and it's not a question of it's never a question of us. Oh, you might as well get on with it. It's it, it's it's all a package. It's it, it's great to be able to work. So it's it's a great privilege it's to have had a. I've, I mean, I've lived lived a privileged existence for over fifty years. Going around doing exactly what I wanted, the way I wanted, where, when I wanted, how I wanted. Whew. So, you know, 50 years and they'll find out about stuff and walk, walk up blind alleys and bump into walls and fall flat on the face and people will still <laughs> clap you at the end of the evening and, 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 and pay you. <laughs> you know, what a, what a dream existence. <laughs> so it's, 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 uh, it's been fabulous and it's, and it's still that exciting. As far as I'm concerned, I can't see any reason. I can't see why I would want to stop. Oh, well, that, that's good news for all of us. That's fantastic. Hey, Martin, thanks so much for your time. It's been, a, been an honour speaking to you. And uh, thank you for opening our eyes and ears to some wonderful songs through the years. And I uh, hope there's still plenty more to come. Well, thank you, John. I've enjoyed every minute of it. And I hope I've gone enjoying it. <laughs> thank <laughs> you very much indeed. Thank you. Hope to see you down in Oz again one time soon. That'd be oh, great. Oh yes, I'm actually coming to the national festival this, uh, the, the next year. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, it's. I, I, th I think. I think it's been confirmed. I'm pretty. Sure, I'm, I'm almost certain it's been confirmed. Oh, that's brilliant. That's that's great news. Great. Really. Thanks again, Martin. Okay. Thank you, John. All the best. Bye bye. Bye.